Well, welcome in the precious name of Jesus to the Ignited Mentoring Series. My name is Robert Pears. In this episode, we're going to talk about the Spirit-filled life, and I'm going to share insight from Catherine Coleman. When you look at the church, the church was birthed by the Holy Spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit in us that makes us a believer. This walk on this earth is meant to be, for us believers, a walking in and by the Spirit. Our lives should be filled with the Holy Spirit, allowing Him to manifest Himself through us. We know that Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come and He would empower us to be witnesses so that our lives fully reflect the victory that Jesus won, that we have a real message of a real Jesus for people facing real problems. I look at the church today and I see so many people so ignorant of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is essential in our lives. We talk about how Christianity is a relationship, but it is so much more than that. It is an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit and His abiding in us. And as we walk in that fellowship, there's a transformation that occurs, that we are conformed, transformed into His image by the work and operation of the Holy Spirit. So stay with me and let us press in to get an understanding of what it truly means to be Spirit-filled. So Father, we come in the name of Jesus. I pray for such a word to be warm, fresh bread of your presence that ministers life, feeds, and leaves each person changed. I pray, Holy Spirit, that as you open our eyes to see ears to hear and give us a hearing heart, that you would so open the word and that you would teach us and show us let us learn about your ministry and how to walk in and by you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, Father, and I thank you. Amen and amen. Now, let's start in Galatians chapter 5. As we look at Galatians, Paul is speaking to the church and explains to them that they started in the Spirit, but now they're trying to perfect it in the flesh. And that's exactly what we're seeing on the earth at this point in time. Many churches have almost padlocked the door to prevent the Holy Spirit coming in because we don't want Him to come and do things that we're not comfortable with. And we therefore have a version of Christianity that is devoid of the Spirit, and that can never be. You and I were born by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and we are dependent on that ministry. He was the precious gift given by the Father that Jesus said it is better that He went away that the gift, the precious promise, the Holy Spirit would come. And He would come not just to be with us, but to abide in us. And through that abiding in us, to so change us, that all the things that people struggle with on this earth, we are to be such a peculiar people, that we gain a far surpassing victory by allowing the Holy Spirit to change us, to teach us, to lead us. In Galatians 5, Verse 25, Paul wrote, If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So our life comes by the operation of the Spirit. By the Holy Spirit, we partake of that divine life, that higher life, that higher life that Jesus came that we might have and that abundant. So we so need the Holy Spirit to really enjoy the abundant life here on this earth. That abundant life is the life in which we are filled with His peace, kept no matter what the storm is, no matter what's going on around, we are kept by the operation of the Holy Spirit. But we're also called to walk so that our whole process and what we do on this earth and how we do it should be done in such a way where the Holy Spirit is the voice speaking into our lives. In Galatians 6 verse 8, it says, For the one who sows to his flesh will from his flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life, or this eternal God-like life that starts here on this earth. In this frail human vessel, the Holy Spirit comes and so transforms it and demonstrates His power through it. Now, in Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 6, we see what Daddy God has for us, the life of a believer. But how can we live such a life? We need the Holy Spirit. Look at, the, look at this, Proverbs 3, 1 through 6. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. 
for the length of days and years of life, and peace will be added to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord, and with all your heart, do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. We are meant to live because in this life, we are living in a fallen planet where there are so many challenges, where there's an enemy out seeking to destroy us, where we have the world and the flesh out against us. All the odds seem stacked against us, so how can we truly walk victorious? How can we walk in the midst of a storm and have perfect peace? How can we have a joy, not a happiness, because happiness is dependent upon situations. It is an emotional response to a good situation. But we're called to have a joy that is meant to be a spiritual strength so that no matter what you're going through, this joy stands. It stands at the grave. It stands when we're in the day of victory. It stands at our greatest defeat that we can be kept by His joy. We are called to walk by a different order. On this earth, there's the, the natural order. That natural order is dictated by the law of survival, the fight, survival of the fittest. But we're called to walk by a spiritual order. While the natural order walks where we're dictated to by the soul, which is the mind, the will, and the emotions, we are called to walk by the spirit in which we walk on a higher way, a way that we represent the Lord God on this earth, walking in the liberty that Jesus bought for us. Catherine Coleman said this, what is the magic formula to a successful life? Now, first of all, we got to understand what is a successful life. Jesus explained that we would bear much fruit. We are here by honor. We are honored to be on this earth. And as believers, every moment, every day that we're on this earth, we are to produce fruit. That is something that we do out of love for Father God, love for what Jesus did. And what an honor for Him to come and work through us to produce something that is eternal. Because that fruit is something eternal. And it's something, there's a crown that we'll one day receive that we can lay at His feet in such wonderful worship. So what is this magic formula that it's going to somehow cause us to walk in victory? Catherine explained, If you will turn to the Scriptures, you will find the answer outlined and described again and again. But the reality is, many people walk, and I've said this before, in the knowledge about the Word. They have studied it, they've been told, they've read all kinds of books, particularly believers. And so they have this knowledge of the different ins and outs of the Word. But we have to walk in a revelation, that place where the Holy Spirit comes and opens it up. You look in the time of Jesus. He preached the most anointed, perfect messages, but He said, many hear with their ears, but they're not hearing with their spirit. It's not going deeper. It's not being accomplishing the purpose that God wants in our life. And the same thing is happening today. The Lord God is speaking through His Word, and it is those that have ears to hear by the Spirit that are hearing what the Lord has to say. Now, if I continue, Catherine Coleman said, and I really like as I talk about Catherine Coleman and share insight in this video from her, because as you look at Catherine Coleman, she was a woman who at a very early age had developed a powerful ministry there in Denver. She had a church that many famous ministries came, and she had such a powerful name and reputation that she'd be in the newspapers. She truly had become a very powerful person. But then she made a bad decision, and despite all the Spirit's warnings, she refused to heed, and she ended up making a marriage decision that almost destroyed her ministry and her life. After quite a number of years, she would repent and get back and walk again in a powerful ministry, perhaps even better. And we all make mistakes because we are here in a frail earthen vessel walking on a fallen planet. And the only way that we can walk and stay in God's perfect will in that place of His um, victory that He has for us is by the Spirit. Jesus, our role model, demonstrated as we look at his life for 30 years, nothing. 
We don't hear about all those years. We don't know what he did. We know he was a carpenter, but we don't know all the things that he did during that time period. But when he receives the baptism and the filling of the Holy Spirit, he all of a sudden goes through the wilderness, comes out of it in the power of the Holy Spirit, having crucified the flesh, surrendered wholly, and learned an absolute obedience to the Holy Spirit. His ministry was one in which he had emptied himself and was walking while perfect God, perfect human, emptied of himself and allowed the Holy Spirit complete and full operation in his life. He laid an example that we can follow because he came and he walked this earth not as God, though he was. He walked it as a man under the anointing leadership of the Holy Spirit, showing that we too, if we will come to Jesus, and receive the gift of the Father, the Holy Spirit, the difference He can make in our lives. Catherine Coleman, who I said went through so many things, in her latter years, started to understand the importance of this intimacy of fellowship with the Holy Spirit, of the need to get her out of the way and allow the Spirit of God to work through us. He is such a perfect gentleman, and because before the Lord, your free will is the most important thing. He wants you to come out of free will and worship. He wants you out of free will to allow the Holy Spirit to work in you and through you. Catherine said, if I were to ask you if the Holy Spirit is a person and are you conscious of a personal relationship and a close communion with fellowship with Him, you would probably answer, I have never been really conscious of any fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And in reality, most believers today don't walk in that place of relationship with the Holy Spirit. We see Him as some kind of mist, some kind of vapor, and we don't realize that He's a person who comes to abide in us and to be with us. We need to develop in the secret place. I've done so many videos on this secret place, so to help you better understand that that secret place is where we come when no one's looking because we desire Him and we want a real relationship with Him. It has to be built in our private time if it's going to manifest in our public. Many people, their Christian walk is what they do at church and what is public. And we need to be a, a thousand times bigger on the inside because of the time we spend seeking His face when no one's looking. That's the real proof of the pudding. Catherine went on to say, you might even come back to me with a question and ask, how is it possible for me to have a personal fellowship and communion with the Holy Spirit? Well, after all, isn't He just some kind of vapor or mist? But when we understand that He is a person, then we start to recognize that means He has a personality. And we have fellowship with those who we can that have that personality, who are persons. That's who we have fellowship with. Now, if I continue here, Catherine said this, Now we know that you cannot have fellowship with somebody who is not a real person to you. Therefore, first of all, we have to have proof from God's Word that the Holy Spirit is a person and that the Holy Spirit is God. We need to personally, and I want to so encourage you, uh, to do your homework, to get into the Word and begin to do a study on the Holy Spirit. i got videos on that and we're going to produce some more to help you better understand the Holy Spirit, His personality, and His ministry. And of course, to always build it upon the Word, to get into the Word and see what the Word says. Now, Catherine Coleman said this, Usually, we divide the categories of a personality into three realms, intellect, emotion, and will. With the intellect, the person can know, can think, and can understand. That is the reason I know that I am a person. You can be sure that you are a person because you have an intellect. Then, there is the emotional capacity through which we can feel and can love. Finally, there is a will by which a person can act and make decisions. True fellowship comes out of a free will coming together, out of a free will desire. You may want to be my friend. You may want fellowship with me, 
But unless I, by my free will, choose it, we don't have it. So it has to have both parties coming together to have fellowship by free will. And we're invited by the blood of Jesus to come into the secret place. And Paul would write in 2 Corinthians, in the last chapter, the last verse, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, that intimacy of fellowship. And I'll come back to that in a minute. She went on, Catherine, to say, Paul tells us here that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, knows and that he has intellect. And she's referring to the scripture where the Holy Spirit knows the heart. Who knows the truth of a person, the depths of a person, but the Spirit within them. And the Spirit of living God knows the depths of the Father. He knows the heart, the thoughts. And now, what does the Spirit of God know? He knows the deep things of God, all that is in the Father, and all that is of divine truth that the Father is, and understand and is known by the Holy Spirit. Because He knows He can reveal what He knows concerning God. He can reveal to us the deep secrets of the Father. We come, and how does the Spirit of God speak? He speaks always through the Word. He points to the Word. Jesus explained that He will come and take of Jesus and remind us, reveal, make it personal. The Word, of course, was written by the anointing and operation of the Holy Spirit. It can only be understood by the anointing and revelation that comes from the Holy Spirit. Line upon line, precept upon precept, um, a little here, a little there. And as we allow the Holy Spirit in that secret place, through our fellowship with Him, to speak to us, open the Word, and so minister to us spiritually. You and I are consisting of a spirit. That's the real you. Now at the fall, men died spiritually. And so they lost the natural, the spiritual order that God created, that you were a spirit being, that you have a soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions. But since the fall, that has become the dominant thing, the mind, the will, and the emotions. But you are a spirit with the soul living on a body. We can only live on this earth with a living body. We need it. That's why when we go to heaven, we, may, we can be there, we're spiritual beings. But there's a day we're told we're coming back and there'll be a millennial reign on the earth. But we're told that there's coming a day where those who have died in Christ will receive their bodies renewed, restored. And in fact, our bodies, which are dying and in death, will also be made alive. We will receive the completion of that salvation that Jesus promised. Now, we are saved spiritually, but the Bible says that in this walk on the earth, we need to continuously renew our mind. Our soul area needs to be saved. It is done so by the Word. And as we spend time in the secret place, fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit, He speaks to us the Word, and the Word is a living force. When received, it will begin to grow, it will begin to work in and through you, transforming you. As I continue, get my notes here. Catherine explained, I cannot give you more than I've experienced. Um, sorry, I cannot give you more than I've experienced myself. No man can teach something that he does not know himself. And one of the pre first prerequisites of a good teacher is that he must know his subject. Therefore, if the Holy Spirit is able to teach the things of Christ, if the Holy Spirit is able to reveal the deep things of the Father and the Son, it is because He knows the things of God, and the Spirit knows because He possesses the capacity of intellect. He has the ability to know, and that is one of the most necessary components of a true personality. And we want, you, know, you think about real fellowship. Real fellowship satisfies spirit, soul, and body. It meets the needs of the spirit, the soul, and the body. And the only relationship that can fully do that is with the living God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And as long as we are on this earth, the Holy Spirit, we are told, will never leave us, nor forsake us. And He is here. And the call, particularly in this hour, is that every single day we get into the secret place and develop that relationship with Him. You look at marriages or any real relationship, unless 
there's an investment made into that relationship, unless there's a developing of that relationship, unless there's always a pressing forward to develop and take that relationship even deeper, what happens is the relationship slowly goes cold and begins to fall apart. And it's usually built upon the lines of communication. Why do so many people get divorced? When you look at it, it is summed up in that one word, communication. And we have to understand that we need to have a rich, intimate, deep fellowship and communication with the Holy Spirit. That must be every day, must grow, must flourish, and must always become deeper and stronger. Now, Catherine Coleman explained of the Holy Spirit that there's no greater power in the world than the power of the Holy Spirit. So often, because we live in this fallen planet, we think of what is great and strong and mighty, and we're not trained to think of the greatest force, the Holy Spirit. We don't see Him operating in our churches. I love to study revivals, and I've done many videos. I'm going to do more on them because they're so powerful. In them, you see how it was not the impact or influence of a person, but it was people crying out and yielding themselves, allowing the Holy Spirit to come and move in such a magnificent and powerful way that it would go beyond the four walls of a church. It would impact a region, a city, a, a nation, and it caused hearts to be changed. It did things. You look at prior to how people were trying to you know, lead people to the Lord, draw the backsliders back, do great things, gave it all their best efforts, like so many today, but it was not as impactful as it should have been. But when the Holy Spirit came in a mighty revival, it changed everything. You look at some of the greatest mockers and scoffers struck down to the ground by the power of the Spirit, only to be so wrecked by the love that they would become some of the greatest believers. We need that ministry of the Holy Spirit to come because He's bigger than us. And Jesus said in the beginning of the book of Acts, told His disciples, wait until the Spirit comes. And the Holy Spirit would come and empower them, give them the power to, on this earth, be a witness. When we get to heaven, we don't need to be a witness because we'll be with Jesus. But on this earth, the world is looking at you and I. The world is sitting there and we are meant to be salt and light. To be that witness, witness of what? That Jesus truly came, Jesus truly died, Jesus truly overcame and now lives, having obtained a complete victory over the enemy. So that the things of this earth, the laws, the controls, and all the things that we find on this earth that make life so difficult, that cause addictions and problems and all these perversions, and many people strive and do everything they can to be set free from them. But they don't recognize there's a spiritual force of the enemy that they're warring against. So we need the Holy Spirit, who is the stronger strongman, who's able to come. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Until you fully taste of that, it's hard to explain it. To live a life where you are free. To live a life where there's not that weight and heaviness. There's not that struggle that we so are used to on this planet, that we can be in the midst of a storm and yet perfectly at peace, perfectly confident because we have a perfect God watching over us. And we have that Holy Spirit sealing us, confirming that. Now, Catherine Como went on to say, in view of this promise of the Holy Spirit made by our Lord, let me ask you, what are you doing with this power? What are you doing with this wonderful gift? What are you doing in the world today with the Holy Spirit, with the greatest gift that was possible for Jesus to give? You know, I've seen, I remember once, giving somebody a gift. It was a precious gift to me. But when I visit that person, oh, about almost a year later, I turn up in their office and there is the gift still unwrapped, still untouched, unused. And it was an insult not even opened. And the purpose when we give gifts is not just to see the smile on the face when they open it, but the knowledge that they'll use it, that it'll have an impact, that it would bless them. And so we desire to give a gift as a reflection of our love, our interest, and to bless somebody. The Holy Spirit was given by the price Jesus paid 
as the perfect gift of the Father. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit should make such a difference in our lives. But we need to fully receive Him. We have to allow Him to come in the fullness of who He is, the Teacher, the Comforter, the Mighty God, and allow Him to do in us what He needs to do. Recognize that we are simply human vessels and He is Lord. And it's out of this ministry of the Holy Spirit that we look at what Paul would explain, Jude would explain, that we are to pray in the Spirit. Look what he says in Ephesians, the last chapter, praying with all types of prayer in the Spirit, all types. So that's not just praying in tongues, but that's every prayer should come out of the inspiration and with the help of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes a difference. I don't know about you, but a lot of my life, I wanted to pray that perfect prayer because I knew that if I could pray the perfect prayer, it would get results that would be so good. I would pray for somebody. You ever had somebody ask you to pray and it's a situation that's so dire that you look and you don't in yourself have the answer. You're not even sure how to pray for that. But the Holy Spirit never comes up short. And the Holy Spirit always prays the perfect prayer. He will come and inspire that in us. Our worship should come out of that flow because we're to worship in spirit and truth so that our lives lived on this earth are constantly reflecting and glorifying the Lord by allowing the Spirit of God to work in us and through us. We think about services, church services, and we'll define sometimes that was so anointed. And the question is, was it really anointed? Or was it just, it so appealed to us, it was such a great production, it appealed to us. Those, you know, I look back many years ago, where there was such anointings in our services. You know, you would go to certain churches and you could feel the anointing in the air. And when you taste it once, you never forget it. When you feel the Spirit of God moving, it is so incredible. Nothing else compares to it. And we need that today. We don't need the most finely tuned message that has the 10 rules to be successful in this and that. A psychologically determined message that truly appeals and gives you that sugar high. We need the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit can take, and you look at some of the heroes of faith, they were not great orators. They were not great preachers in that sense. Paul even said to the church in Corinthians that when he was with them, his preaching was in what? In fear and trembling. But he didn't stop there because his frail human flesh was not the thing that delivered the message. It was the Holy Spirit through that frail human flesh. Because he said, but his preaching was in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. We need that. I recall some phenomenal speakers that you could hear, listen to. And when you heard, even when you were saved, you wanted to get saved again. There was such an anointing on their message. I go to so many services and you've become oblivious to everything so consumed in the living God because of the anointing. Breakthroughs suddenly came. There wasn't a laboring, struggling, but because we were in such an environment where the Spirit was allowed to move, He brought with Him breakthroughs. We walked away, something happened on the inside of us, and we were changed. We need that. If I go to Acts chapter 6, the people come to the disciples, and there's, of course, it, it has grown, and with anything, there's growing pains. And they're like, who can serve the widows and serve at the tables? Well, today we know it. You just pick those that are faithful to turn up. Some churches, just somebody with volunteer. Other churches, you know, what they look for is those that are faithful. And some people go faithful, not just in attendance, faithful in tithes, and faithful to walk politically correct, honoring the pastor. But look at this in Acts 6, verse 3. The apostles, in speaking and giving the instructions to the people on how to determine these seven men to do this menial task, said this. 
Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation. And that's where today the church stops. But they didn't. It said, full of the Spirit and wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. I think about that. A menial task. What skills do you need for it? You need to be full of the Holy Spirit. And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there comes wisdom. Because the Spirit comes. He's the Spirit of wisdom, discernment, understanding. He comes upon us. And He begins, you even look in the Old Testament, there was an anointing for craftsmanship. There's an anointing for skill. The Spirit of God enables us to do an extraordinary, even better um, thing that we could without Him. You know, maybe you're skilled at certain things. Maybe you're blessed in certain areas. But when you allow the Holy Spirit to come on that, He takes that which is good and makes it extraordinary. He takes that which is not good, but surrender to Him and makes it extraordinary. And He's able to do in us and through us exceedingly, abundantly, according to that mighty power working in us, the Holy Spirit. You think about your family and you're trying to relate to them. You're trying maybe to lead them to the Lord. And all your efforts have failed. But when we allow the Spirit of God to come in, He gives us perfect wisdom and shows us. Sometimes it's not in our words that Peter explained regarding wives and their unbelieving husband, but it's in that silent conversation. It's in that constant witness where they see something different in us. And people should. The world should look at you and see that you are being changed because in the world, people want to be different, but a leopard can't change its spot. It cannot truly change its nature. It can try to be a better person, but the Holy Spirit takes that which is yielded and He transforms it, causing it both to will and to do God's good pleasure, causing you to be sanctified holy, to have a purity and a beauty about you, to have a, a life and that life you can't manufacture. You cannot make it in a jar. You cannot fake it until it happens. But when the Holy Spirit is in you, there's a life so that your words drip with that life and they're able to do something beyond that which we see, to go in and minister at the deepest level in somebody's life. It can be just a simple statement. Jesus, it says he healed with just one word. Think about that. You read the Gospels. There were times he healed the masses with just one word. And one anointed, spirit-filled, touched, guided, and inspired word can change your life forever, can change your family, your marriage, can change all things. If we just appreciate it and understood the wonderful Holy Spirit and how he wants to come and so fill this vessel, to take this temple, fill it, and make it a place of perfect worship in which the Father, the living God, comes and abides in us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, I alluded to this verse earlier. Let's look at this. Finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the love of God and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. There is an expectation, and the early church knew that. The early church turned the world upside down without all the tools that we have today. Despite some of the most severe persecutions being put to death. And you think about all those things which should have ended Christianity in those early days, couldn't because of the Holy Spirit. And as they killed believers, persecuted them, their death became seed that caused even more. Because when the Holy Spirit is moving, He's able to do. He is final authority. He is the stronger strongman. And no matter what the enemy plans, the world plans, it cannot stand in the way of the Holy Spirit. I don't care what people say about your life. I don't care what you think about your life. All the limitations, I can't do this, I can't do that. When we yield 
and spend time with the Holy Spirit, He begins to birth in us a vision from the Father that's of Jesus. That vision, our purpose for the life. We may stand and have so many mountains in our way, so many walls hindering us, that everything around us says it's impossible, but not to the Holy Spirit. And the Lord God loves such situations where you are unable naturally to do it because He wants to do something by His Spirit in your life to demonstrate His love towards you and to give you such a comfort that you're able to comfort others, to have something that's real, bigger, beyond you, something that scars your heart forever, that writes that word on your heart, incises it, puts it there, and that you know and you'll never forget that your God has worked and moves on your behalf in such a mighty way. The word for fellowship in Greek, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but it means an intimacy of fellowship, an association, and a joint participation. And that really is our fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We are called to have a joint participation. Our role is simply to be surrendered and be willing and obedient, to take our will and give it to free willy, by our free will, I should say. Say, Holy Spirit, have your way in me and through me. That's called sowing to the Spirit. I've done a video on that. If you uh, want to understand that better, go watch that video. Catherine Coleman said this, Here Paul begins by exhorting all Christians to grow into maturity, to be perfect in spite of pain and afflictions, and in spite of suffering and temptations. Because this is what the, this fallen world, it's not a valley of filled with roses. We all know that. We know there are difficult seasons on this earth, and especially in this last hour, where it's becoming increasingly perilous and difficult times. We need the Holy Spirit. She went on to say, we are still in the world, but not of this world, living in an old body of flesh, yet we are challenged to be perfect. How can that be? We agree that such a thing as perfection in oneself is impossible. And I meet so many people that set so many resolutions, trying to come to this place where they are a better person, where they overcome all these things, but the flesh can't overcome the flesh. And when we realize that we're facing a spiritual war, then you cannot use weapons of the flesh. You will be defeated. But when you lay hold of the weapons the Spirit gives, you gain always a far surpassing victory. She went on to say, but Paul was talking about the perfection of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. That's a perfection that is beyond. I can draw in my mind this level of perfection that I want to achieve, a level of perfection in terms of my behavior, my, my um, different aspects of me. And I can give everything I have to, to arrive but I'll always fall short. But here, the perfection that we're called to live is not of the flesh. It's so much higher, so much greater, that you cannot in any way, if you can't achieve it in the natural, there's no way you'll achieve it in the spiritual without the Holy Spirit. And that's why we so need Him. That is why every day we must cling to Him. And we must begin to realize how much more can be accomplished in us and through us, in your work, in your family, in your church, in every aspect of your life, that when we allow the Holy Spirit, when we start the day in the Spirit, and allow the Spirit to have His way, to give us favor, to give us an anointing, so that we walk and do by the anointing, it's always going to be above and beyond. So if you're struggling in some area, learn how to get into the secret place and surrender and allow the Spirit of God to have His way in this joint participation in which we volunteer, in which we surrender, in which we invite and allow, and we receive full of the Holy Spirit, giving Him the place in our life. Now let me finish with this. Catherine Coleman said, Do you understand what it means that you and I, frail creatures of this dust, may have fellowship and commune with the Holy Ghost? I encourage you to read 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4. Paul has explained that we are not adequate of ourselves. 
but the Spirit. He begins to talk about the wonderful ministry of the Holy Spirit. That as you go into chapter 4, he explains that because of this ministry of the Holy Spirit, we do not grow weary. We always have because He's always imparting life. He's always causing the hope within us to become clearer, sharper, our faith to be stirred. Because as we allow the Spirit of God to open the Word, the Word is living, producing faith, and we understand that we can know the living God and trust Him. We know that that seal is on us, the Holy Spirit bearing witness that we are indeed the children of God, that you never have to walk a day in this earth where your flesh or the world or the devil can so declare into your life that you are a nothing and a nobody. You are a child of the living God. And the Holy Spirit will bear witness with that 24-7, every day. He will always be seeking to lift you and meet you in that place of your weakness, to pray through you, to grow, and to do a mighty work on the inside. The Holy Spirit starts in us. And as we allow, it begins to grow until it changes from the inside out, until we truly become that new vessel, a vessel of honor, able to do something that is beyond anything we dare ask, think, or imagine. So whether, as I said before, this is for business, whether you're trying to start a business, whether the job you're at, you want to do it better, whether it's in your marriage, your finances, any aspects of your life, the Holy Spirit, if received, if we spend and develop this relationship with Him, allow Him way and right in our lives, He will so anoint you, He will teach you and show you and bring you to a place that you can never imagine. We are called to live a life filled with the Spirit, full, always full, taking of the well of salvation and coming to the place of rivers of living water flowing through us. Think about how precious you are to Him, but how God also sees you so precious that He wants to use you. He wants to pour in and pour through. So it no longer becomes about you, but impacting the world around you by the ministry of the Spirit. As I close, I will share this, that many of us can recognize people and the impact they have, for example, in social justice and things like that, by giving it all, by being the voice. But that is a voice that is of the natural man. And if the natural man can accomplish great things, how much more of the Spirit? And that is why the early church turned the world upside down. That is why Christianity, despite all the persecutions, never fails. Because the gates of hell will never prevail against the blood-bought church of Jesus. And the blood-bought church is the church that has that intimacy of fellowship with the Spirit of the living God, His abiding in us, manifesting Jesus through us. Amen? Well, I pray this message ministers to you. And if it has, would you please like, share, and would you subscribe if you're not a subscriber? Check the notification button to get notices of our new videos. My heart and my desire is to really edify the body of Christ and always draw us into a more intimate relationship with Him in the secret place. I've experienced many difficult seasons in my life, and I discovered that in every season in the secret place, He is able to keep us in perfect peace, filled with joy, so that that which is going on around us no longer gets in us. I thank you for watching, and I would encourage if you would, Consider becoming a prayer partner. If you want to be a financial partner, we thank you. We need those as well. If you don't have a local church and you want to join us for our Zoom services, we do those. Then please go to our website, go to the partner page, and you'll gain more information. Thank you for watching. Know that we love you. We're praying for you. And Jesus is coming soon. So let us remember that this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it because of, through, and for him. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Thank you.